morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. Nice to see you. All right, we're just coming up on the hour. Okay. I hope you're all well. So let me go ahead and call up our presentation for today. Okay, that should be available. So it's good to see you. Today's readings, uh, I had a difficult time uh, discerning where I would begin and end them. So they're a little bit long and they'll carry us through this section because the citations that I have both from scripture and elsewhere uh, sort of feed and build on one another. And I thought you would lose the thread if I attempted to separate them by, by chunking it too, in too small a measure. So um, the readings this morning will be slightly uh, longer than normal. So as always, Ben and Christinet, it's great to see you all and welcome back. Our opening prayer this morning. <clears throat> Let us pray. If you, Christ Jesus, are to be Lord of my heart, make me to know you are Lord of all hearts. If your gospel is to free me, make me to be an agent of liberation for all who know the tyranny of heart or mind or society. May I let go of the need for an inner life that is as tidy as it is neat, as it is perfect, for one that allows the mess of my own heart to teach me compassion toward all hearts who live even now in distress. Amen. So our reading this morning uh, comes from um, <clears throat> chapter four, standing pages uh, 120 to 121. Let's scroll that down for ease. So it's one thing to name and even exercise one's demons, but there is a communal dimension to this kind of liberation. Christian ascesis opens the way to freedom from the tyranny of the ties that bind us, but it is not a freedom for its own sake. It is a freedom that must itself open the way to a fuller life in service of the gospel. To cultivate a spiritual life that is neat and tidy because it isolates itself from the messiness of the world deprives the interior life of its fulfillment. That is, the exorcism of unclean spirits must open the way to a new kind of possession by the Holy Spirit, whose divinizing presence in us leads to authentic discipleship. Spiritual liberation that is not manifested in social justice or transformed into service risks opening us to a worse spiritual condition than before, one that is easily overtaken by the spirit of pride, arrogance, a sense of superiority, hypocrisy, and condescension. These are the other spirits that threaten to fill the void of one who strives for interior purity and perfection apart from service of others. The sayings of the Desert Fathers express this in a tale of two brothers. <clears throat> a brother asked an elder, there are two brothers. One of them fasts six days in a row, giving himself a great deal of hard labor but the other one takes care of people in distress. Whose task will God more readily accept? The elder said to him, even if the one who fasts for six days were to hang himself up by the nostril, he cannot be equal to the one who cares for people in distress. Jesus warns of such demons when preaching to the crowds about the danger of hypocrisy and complacency in Matthew's gospel. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through waterless regions, looking for a resting place, but it finds none. 
And then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings along seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and live there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. And so it will be also with this evil generation. Amen. So our second reading today comes uh, from pages 121 to 122. R.T. France observes in his commentary on Matthew, that this cautionary tale does not relate directly to any of the exorcisms recorded in the gospel, but is a comment on a danger associated with exorcism in general. A person liberated from demonic possession remains vulnerable to further possession if they remain vacant. Based on Jesus's teaching throughout the gospel, France concludes that this vacancy must be fulfilled by discipleship, and therein lies the power of Asasis. We must be like the Gerasene man. Freed of his demons, he is sent home, back to his community, where Mark 5.20 tells us he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. The fruit born of asceticism is the reintegration of the whole person within themselves and within the community of which they are members. This is the basis of contemplative discipleship in the modern world. The question then, the, excuse me, the questions then remain. How does the modern contemplative engage in an ascesis that opens the way for real interior and social transformation? How does one identify their demons even as they open themselves to the reconciling grace of the cross in the midst of daily life? And how do our interior practices crucify us to the world in a way that reconciles individuals and transforms society? So we close. Let us pray. Fill, O Lord, my emptiness with your presence. When I pour myself out to you, let my heart be not vacant, but be ready, attentive, expectant. When the silence of mind and heart is not enough, may it spill over into the silence of my flesh where compassionate action might rush in to fill the void. Amen. So um, once again, good morning and good evening and good afternoon. It's good to see you all. So uh, the, the readings were a bit long today. For that, I apologize. I, I was trying to thematically hold them together. Um, but as always, I'm open to your questions and comments. Uh, Carol, good morning. Boy, this is timely. Um, I was up till three o'clock reading Thomas J. Ord. Have you ever heard of him? No. No. And then and Jurgen Moulton, who you've recommended oh, before. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, but two things I wanted to just say really quickly. Um, I live in the Washington, D.C. area, and um, I don't know if, the, if this made the national news, but there are body bags laid out all over the mall of everybody that's been killed by a gun since Columbine, from anybody just walking into the, uh, an employment office and shooting or a high school and shooting, whatever. And it was spelled out thoughts and prayers. And they're basically mocking, we don't want your thoughts and prayers, we want your action. 
you know, and it's, it's a really profound statement. And it makes me think a lot about being a Christian. And when I was reading those books, they were saying, I think it was Moulton that was saying, we're not called to, um, well, I would put this in my phrase, used Christ as a self-actualization for myself, <laughs> but to change a community, change the world that God acts through us to change, bring about the kingdom of God. And, you know, I'm at the same, like everybody else, what do we do? <laughs> you know, but I think in this case, do we, we change the laws, we change the gun laws. We, I mean, I know Scotland had no problems getting rid of their guns after that horrible Dunblane thing, was that it? When somebody, you know, and yet what happened with our school children up there in New York or whatever, and it just went away, you know, I mean, stays, whatever it was called, something hook, so anyway. Sandy hook. Sandy hook. I mean, I mean, why do we not have any shame? And what are we doing as Christians to not speak out instead of saying, you know, just we'll send our thoughts and prayers, you know, and I feel the same way about Ukraine. I don't know what the answer is. I, I, I think as a community, we need to address um, what we can do. I mean, everybody has different skills. Everybody has different ways. Some people are out there volunteering. I can maybe help fund or I can help join a group that packages things, and, you know, and sends things out. But then the other thing about this Asasis thing that, I, that Moulton, Moulton said, which I loved, we was talking about Jacob, which is one of my favorite stories about Jacob and the angel wrestling. And he said that the spirit inside of you is going to wrestle with you the rest of your life, just like Jacob. And that get used to that. <laughs> and I'm obviously I'm one of those people that wrestles and wrestles and wrestles and wrestles. And I look at other people who are so calm. <laughs> and I think, you know, sending thoughts and prayers. <laughs> <laughs> or and I just think what's wrong with me but then it, it re reinforced in me that that's what the spirit is doing inside of you he's it's the Jacob and you wrestle it's the humanity and you wrestling with the transformation that the spirit is bringing about in you and that he was calling us to continue to wrestle that that's how you change and grow is that you fight and you fight and you fight and then you either give up or see you know, what the spirit was trying to bring about in you. So anyway, those are my thoughts for today. Yeah, Carol, thank you. All very, very poignant, actually. And I was not aware of the, the body bag display. I'll, I'll look for that um, as, a, as a way of, you know, reflecting on, on the message there. And uh, just a few comments, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know how to say this in a way that may not sound snarky, but it doesn't, it's truly not intended to be. But one of the things that I'm trying to impress upon the, my readers in this chapter is that the Christian contemplative life really isn't about navel gazing or aligning my chakras or perfecting my inner spiritual life. It really is about, uh, you know, what all of those practices, at least as they've become popularized through mindfulness or, you know, meditation divorced of any spiritual or theological tradition, it really has become another word for self-help. And, 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 and with that comes an implicit emphasis on the self, self-improvement, uh, getting my, my own little world, spiritual inner world aligned and perfected and so forth. Um, cr Christian discipleship, especially Christian contemplative discipleship, is not about self-help. It's about self-forgetfulness. It's about letting go of the self to stop em uh, emphasizing the self. And as I try to express in the distillation of the themes today in the prayers that I, I drafted for this morning is, is, the, is the real connection that until um, the, the inner silence is transformed, uh, the inner silence of the heart is transformed into the silence of the flesh in which there is real action in which it in which my own death to self becomes meaningful it means nothing to crucify myself to the world to use paul's term if that isn't a, a, a kind of crucifixion for others on behalf of others for the sake of being christ for others it is not uh something that is just for my own privatized enlightenment and um the real beauty of the christian life is you, you don't perfect self in isolation. 
Um, even, even, you know, many of you, if you were listening carefully, may be surprised by the, the desert mothers and fathers that the citation we heard today in the question about, you know, what will get me more right with God, um, so serving someone in distress or fasting for 40 days or whatever the, 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 the point was. And of course, the spiritual father says, even if you hang yourself up by your nose and all the spiritual fanfare that is involved is not it is is nowhere near what it means to to um, engage in loving service, and we normally associate the desert mothers and fathers as isolationists, but they clearly weren't. That even their solitude and decades of solitude ended up being in service of others who came for counsel, for spiritual insights, for help of various kinds. So there's always this, um, you know, as I say elsewhere in the chapter. Asasis is prayer turned inside out. The two are essentially one. And it, the, the beauty of an engaged contemplative discipleship does not require us to, as I've said elsewhere, to do everything, but it demands we don't do nothing, that there has to be something that the transformation of my own heart leads to in terms of contributions to a world that hears the gospel, to the darkness in which we bear the light, um, to the ignorance in which we educate and so forth. And, and that so, so that our enlightenment is not part and parcel or defined by my inner perfection. It's defined by letting go of the muck that will always be a part of my inner life, uh, the, the conflicting and struggles that we do, and that we, we, we engage those struggles precisely to learn how to be more compassionate to others who are dealing with their own demons and their own struggles. Um, and that, that transforms somehow into bearers of light, bearers of Christ, bearers of the gospel. There is the, the pinnacle of the Christian contemplative life. Um, and it's so it's reciprocal. It's cross-pollinating. I'm not saying that we should abandon our meditative practices, because when we do that, we, we lose the sense of the real work that where it begins in our own heart. But it doesn't end there. And particularly for Christians in the world, this is a poignant message. Yeah. So I appreciate, Carol, where you're going. And clearly, I, I resonate with that. So thank you. Uh, John, good morning. Yes, uh, good Good morning, Father. Um, I just wanted to um, respond to what you said about the, the, the question of self-help, because I'm a, I'm a therapist. And in the field in, in which I'm involved, um, the phrase <clears throat> is self-care. Mm. And because, uh, and the cliche, which we as therapists hear over and over and over is the, is the thing about when you're on a plane, you have to, and, and, the, and the oxygen drops, you have to put the mask over your own face. And I'm in a field in which things like meditation and yoga and regular physical exercise are necessities. Mm -hmm. um, we have to do it. I have, um, as a family therapist, I have worked with more families than I can count where there was sexual abuse of a child in the mm -hmm. family. And it, and, it, and it tears me up every single time. And that's why I meditate. Um, that's, that's why I, I do the amount of cardio that I do and so forth. And so these, these practices that you're talking about, I mean, in, in my field are, they're regarded as, um, they're not a way to perfection. They're just very practical things. You know, they're, they're like, they're like putting your boots on in the morning, if you're going to take a hike and, uh, I, I think that's, I, I, for me, that's just the kind of the way you look at it, you know, and that's, that's, that's why you, that's why you engage in that stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I don't disagree with that. My, my concern is that um, not that again, we shouldn't be doing our meditative exercises and engaging in meditation and whether that's involved in, practices that are even not traditionally just sitting in silence, you know, to use some of the ones that you just listed. I'm, I'm not suggesting they have no value. What I'm suggesting is I feel like the modern mindfulness industry has made them ends in themselves. And that's where I grapple with them. That's right. Because it does, it just becomes so self, um, uh, self-centered and isolating. 
So, uh, yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I think I say in my introduction, I do mention mindfulness as kind of a step into discipleship, but not an end in itself, right? That it just becomes, it, it is too easily become turned in on itself and has become kind of an elitist thing um, where, um, you know, people who have, frankly, the, the money and the, the luxury of time, uh, because they're not working 15 hours a day to put food on their table, and all, it's become this elitist thing by which I can feel good about myself. And there's nothing wrong with feeling good about yourself. But even, you know, to even the, so with, if I were a therapist, I would make it my job to build someone's ego. I think people need strong, healthy egos. This is, as I've mentioned elsewhere in this book, for example, the ego is not the enemy. The ego is a tool. We just have to learn to use it correctly and can really serve us in society well. It's kind of the identity we assume in the world. Um, but when that becomes an end in itself is where I grapple. So I would have no trouble with anyone practicing any of these techniques or yoga or mindfulness or meditation, to, but to understand that the goal is not turned inward, that there's ultimately, at least within the Christian context, the goal is that I be, I, I use my own messed upness as a way to be a healing agent for someone else in the world. And I think in therapy, that's precisely what your job is, is doing. Yeah. I mean, we do use, uh, we do use this te techniques it's, but it's also worth pointing out that say something like yoga um, is it's an excellent it's an excellent treatment for for trauma that, for sure. uh, it's it's more and more it's becoming the the technique of choice for trauma that if somebody has been highly traumatized talk therapy is generally not the way to go you, you you have them get more into their body and use those and use those techniques. So they aren't necessarily uh, about navel gazing at all. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's you know they 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 have a they have a real use in in engaged engaged spirituality. That's what I'm saying. Indeed, and 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 I think to to your point, the the end goal. If we if we look to any authentic or traditional meditative practice, it always has that aim. Uh, ultimately, I'm not sure that I'm still seeing that in what the United States as a culture has done with them writ large. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and, and, and there's a reason for that. So, so I, so uh, I'm, I, I'm with you on the, on the potential. I, my fear is how often it doesn't become that in, do you see what I'm saying? It, it does. And it, I, it, it frankly depends on, 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 there's class questions involved here. I mean, if, right, if, yeah. you're, if you're in Marin and you're looking down, you see it one way. If you're if you're if you're uh, right. you know in Fresno and looking up, it's gonna look it's gonna look a lot different. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thanks for your your comment on that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Colleen. I think your hand was next. Thank you. Actually, as you um, as you furthered your discussion. Um, I, I, after Carol, I think you kind of point, you, you summarize what I, but I just want to say, I, I think that I'm beginning to see that there's mirror work to be done. Mm -hmm. And the mirror work is for the purpose of detaching myself from the personification of who I think I am, of the, these images that I want to hold out to the world and the work that there is in doing that, to be able to release that, to know a place where I can identify with all because I can see how hard mere work is. It's really hard work. And when you do that mere work, it's the line in this prayer, for one that allows the mess of my own heart to teach me compassion toward all heart, who live even now in distress. And I think that's, for me, I, I'm having a hard time understanding asceticism. I mean, it's like, I think it's so anti-American culture and it it's just hard to get, and it's hard to get my hands around it without it becoming a, uh, becoming a, a work. It's sort of like a gift. It's, it's meant to be a pathway to a gift. 
Right. And again, I just want to say, I think that it's about the practices that I do in meditation and in the mirror work that I do. It's all for opening myself to saying, I don't want what I hold to be the personification of myself to be myself. I, I want a fuller being than just this image that I want to throw to the world and paint to the world. Thank you. Yeah, Colleen, really beautifully said, and I'm I'm with you on that. You know, I think, you know, when you talk about holding up a mirror and how sort of anti-American culture, the idea of asceticism is, is part of the reason why I gave a whole chapter over to this. I mean, again, I, I don't mean this in a critical sense, but even in my own exploration of much of modern contemplative practice through like contemplative outreach and so on, Father Keating, as you probably know, introduced the welcoming prayer, which really is asceticism by another name. It's sort of, you know, that practice of letting go of my needs or wants or desires and really practicing a kind of freedom from uh, what, what prevents me from being loving in this moment. But I've not seen a real thoroughgoing exploration of a theology of asceticism in, in, in much of what I'm reading around modern Christian contemplative practice. And that really is an anomaly. And in some ways probably is a reflection of, a, of you know, the American culture. And, you know, we, we cringe at the idea of self-denial or of, you know, that kind of or criticism of, of the self. But, you know, when Jesus has this teaching, and I think this is what you're saying when you talk about the mirror, you know, um, let me first take the log out of my eye so I can see the speck in yours. That really is a summation of asceticism. It's, it's focusing on my own log um, rather than turning that toward judgment toward another. And really in the humility of understanding the muck of my own inner life and uh, the, the way in which I can convince myself of a persona that I'd like to project in the world and really spending time deconstructing that in my meditation becomes the place from which I realize I have no position, no high horse on which to judge anyone. And there begins compassion for self and how that extends to others. Um, so, so to your point, I do think it's a rather unpopular topic, in part because I think it's largely misunderstood, as I say earlier in the chapter, as a kind of body-hating, weird, eccentric, you know, group of exercises. But it's not. It's really about holding a mirror up to myself, looking honestly and lovingly and compassionately, and having that compassion be the source by which I am compassionate both in action and in thought toward others. So it is this ultimate, as I say, reclamation of the beauty of the, of the world that God has deigned to enter into so fully, uh, despite the ugliness uh, that, you know, of the things Carol opened with this morning, the shootings and Sandy Hook and body bags and, and all the violence we confront. It, it is an insistence on the beauty of the world, a reclamation of that beauty and a freedom to embody that beauty by detaching from judgment detaching from um, from condemnation of myself and others by because I'm really looking authentically at both my own capacity for darkness and still knowing I, it, it was Robert uh, Layler who once said earlier in these sessions why the, the beauty of knowing that God would want to take up residence in this shanty town as he called himself right so we have this and and when you come to the realization of how profoundly beautiful that even in my muck, Christ is, is, is fully abiding, fully present. That just opens up all kinds of beauty um, and allows me to embody that beauty where, so that the world can see it. And this indeed will be my culminating paragraph of the entire chapter, which by the way, was a revision, an edited revision of a letter I wrote to my community when Sandy Hook happened. So how ironic is that, that we should come full circle there? But it was a way of trying to respond to the ugliness we found and the, the, the terror of that moment in a way that said, the beauty is still in the world because you embody it, because it comes through you. So if you're looking for where is beauty in the world, you find it in your own heart and open that in whatever capacity you are to be that beauty for others. We're not going to necessarily find it outside of ourselves, but we find it in those who embody it, starting with our own hearts. So it's hard work, but man, the payoff is beautiful, profound. I, I hope that helps Carol kind of uh, kind of affirm what you're what you're coming to there. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, let's say uh, Nicola, please. Good morning. 
Well, there's two threads to this, and I want to be careful that I don't get lost here. But So I'll start with Carol at the beginning. And the thing that comes up for me when you discuss a thesis, and then that to me equates ultimately to action. But then, as you said a couple of weeks ago, no one wants a profit at their party. Right. And, and so that's one piece that I would like you to unpack a little bit, because I think about that a lot. You know, when you're about change, that is very uncomfortable for people, you know, even on an intuitive level, they don't want to deal with that. Their ways of coping make them comfortable. And, uh, you know, so that's a problem. And then I wanted to address what John was saying, because I think that meditation techniques and physical techniques like yoga, I think that that is so important for the Western world because we are in, so accustomed to being in our headspace, our intellect, and we divorce ourselves from our bodies and think we've got two separate shows going on when in fact we do not. And that our body's intelligence, our heart and our gut really has to be in alignment with our minds for us to be effective. And I mean, that is getting to be more and more obvious to me as I grow older, but it was one of the most shocking things in my life to realize my body's intelligence. Mm. That an amazing thing for me. So, you know, I just wanted to uh, address that, but the no one wants a profit at the party thing. I'd like you to respond to that. Yeah, um, well, I, um, so two things I would say. Uh, first of all, uh, the the change or the transformation that I'm by and large referring to around you know ascetical practice has more to do with the inner work of me recognizing my own need for change and my own resistance to it and my own inertia around it, uh, rather than. Um, the way I envision the, the the prophet at the party who is telling everybody else their need to do that, for example, right? And and in a way, um, not that the prophet is wrong uh, to make those those sort of claims or to insist on that, but my own approach is to just I've got enough work cut out for me to do it. I I, I don't need to be telling anybody else how to how to govern their inner life. And I think that as that what draws people. Um, to Christianity or to any particular spiritual practice or commitment is when they recognize authenticity in another person who embodies it, adheres to it, or so on. And so the reason why I still get invited to parties (laughs) is because I'm fully aware that the work cut out for me is so my own in that sense. And then what I found in my life is that people will uh, oftentimes say, what is that that you feel so much passion around? Or what is it that drives you in that way? Um, And then it's an opportunity to talk about their inner life because they've invited the conversation. And um, so I, I would say that in a sense, that might be the line between a contemplative and a prophet is where the emphasis is placed on social transformation, which I'm demanding of you, rightly or wrongly, or the inner transformation I focus on myself, in which to say, I can't, I'm not contributing to change in society if I'm not dealing with the muck of my own inner life. Um, so, so that's where I would emphasize the, the, that, that we place our emphasis today. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is bound with various times in history, various cultures, whereby different, if you want to borrow a Buddhist term, skillful means might be um, required or expected. Uh, so in our time and culture, you know, I really do believe that knocking on people's doors to share the gospel is not nearly as as effective as embodying it yourself. Because we are so aware of institutional hypocrisy, scandal among the priestly classes of our societies, and so on, that just being wearing the cloth or holding the title isn't enough anymore, and nor should it be. Uh, But it's really about where is there an authentic 
something happening here. That's where we we preach silently uh, the gospel, as Francis would say. And I think that that's really what our culture demands right now. Personal authenticity. If you're going to have any um, sense of of capacity to speak meaningfully to another person. Does that resonate, Nicola, with? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so that would be that would be my approach is let's, let's put the focus on our own transformation. Uh, and then see what happens in our relationships with others. Uh, let's see, uh, Jennifer, please. Good morning and good afternoon or whatever to everybody. Wherever Thanks, you are. Brother Vincent. <laughs> yeah, that was really helpful what you just said. It really, um, I just, I kind of wanted to say something like that in terms of what was sort of rising up for me, but I never could say it as articulate as you, articulately as you did. Mm -hmm. I, um, I empathize with the people that put the body bags in Washington, D.C., but I also say, I also, I, I, I find it concerning as well, because I think that's an example of maybe action without grounding in the spirit and contemplation, action that is wanting to shame and condemn and judge. Maybe I'm being unfair, but um, people don't change when they're feeling shamed and judged and pushed into a corner. I'm not saying there shouldn't be a prophetic voice, but I think there is a need for that balance of doing that inner work, um, recognizing that we all have the capacity to harm and to be blind. And so while we do need activists I, I, and we do need contemplatives and we need a balance, I don't know, I think, I hope we can also give voice to, to you know, keeping ourselves in check about around navel gazing, but also keeping ourselves in check about being too sort of sure of what is true and what is right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that makes sense, but I feel like in this culture, there's a lot of that going on too. Mm -hmm. um, quick, quick to condemn, quick to assume that, you know, others are not doing the work they need to. And we don't know what's going on in the hearts of others. So that's how I'm feeling. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. It's interesting. Just this past Thursday, we had a conversation in, in my class around cancel culture, which I was pretty, um, pretty well condemning and so seeing a lot of problems with. And it was interesting because I had one student in the class who is um, older than the rest. He's about 39. He's a dad. Um, he served in Afghanistan for many years. Um, and in fact, is being called back to service right now to be on guard with everything going on with um, uh, Ukraine. So, you know, he's got a very different perspective than, say, a more, pardon me, but naive, you know, 19 year old who doesn't have that kind of experience of war and, and parenthood and the age, uh, you know, almost double in age. And he was really the one student who really was able to step up and say, yeah, you know, I, I agree with Professor Pizzuto around his concerns around cancel culture. And it was around this question of shaming and how, how well shaming or not actually um, encourages change in a human being as opposed to defensiveness and so forth. And, and when a person is merely made to feel defensive, especially for some of the more egregious cancellations because of somebody said something remotely you know, off color or something in a tweet and, and is having their career essentially canceled um, uh, is deeply problematic because my concern from a gospel perspective is where do we walk with that person in educating and reforming them rather than isolating and shaming them uh, into some false apology, which is clearly given just to save their career or their public reputation and has as much sincerity as a second grader who's, who's required by the principal to apologize to another student for pushing them on the lunch line. And, and the fear is that, you know, we're not really looking here at a society that encourages transformation, but just a new form of shaming. And frankly, in my own life, shaming came a lot from uh, the conservative side, at least toward me, the conservative way of thinking. And now I'm seeing this almost liberal McCarthyism, where there's just this real sense of righteousness around um, who's in and who's out and what you can and cannot say and, and, and how we censor discourse and what's okay. And it's really it has to be looked at. So I think that your point is, how do we, how do we distinguish prophetic action from the kinds of uh, 
techniques we're seeing in, in our culture today that I think are not particularly helpful or thoughtful or compassionate. Um, uh, and, and where is the balance there? So I think it'll work itself out as most things do, but we might have to wait five or 10 years to see a lot of this more clearly to see what it evolves into. Yeah, thank you. I just want to emphasize, I just love how you talked about having compassion for all hearts. And I, I just, I really need that reminder. Well, one of the things that, you know, that I think we learn if we're really moving into the gospel is that there is no cozy relationship between the gospel and any political, social, cultural ideology or political platform. It challenges all of them. It's not comfortable with any of them. It demands a lot from all of them. And we have to be very careful about how we, uh, um, how we are in the world and not of it and, and how we discern uh, how each political party or ideology wants to claim for itself sort of the iteration of the gospel in the modern world. But I find that very suspect. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. I appreciate that. Uh, Ruth, good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to first say how much I have really appreciated everyone's comments and observations in your responses this morning. Um, I wanted to join the conversation um, because I came into the group this morning after one of those really tough hot button uh, issues with my family. Um, and there was no harm intended in their actions. And, there, and what happened is irrelevant for, for this conversation. There was no harm intended, but they stepped on a button that they've stepped on so many times in the last three months that it, buttons just about worn out. Mm -hmm. And I, I joined late right at the beginning of the meditation, knowing I really needed to do that set. So the question I'm bringing has to do with the struggle of understanding. John talked about self-care. He talked about self-help, and that was a great discussion. And this kind of beckons back to that, that difference between a thesis and what you're leading us toward and the self-care. Um, the sit was very hard this morning. Oh, man, I, I must have gone back to the my sacred word, which is just Abba, added to it, please so many times because I was, I was trying, the prayer, the intention was, God, open my heart and do your work within it so that my obsessing over what happened will not make a situation that is hard for me bad for all of us. And I think in my heart that that is the difference between a thesis, that prayer, versus self-care, which is, God, please fix this for me, or please make me feel better. Mm. And I just want you to, to address kind of the accuracy of those observations. You know, thanks, Ruth. And I'm, it's clear that whatever the situation is, um, is very difficult. And I'm very sorry for, uh, for that struggle. Um, um, in many ways, one could say that the best kind of self-care are these meditative practices because they do lead us to a sort of forgetfulness of self ultimately. Um, and uh, so my sense is that as you look to the, to the source of the pain of the situation, ask yourself to what extent it is born of a sense of powerlessness over it. I think that very often when we feel powerless over a situation, particularly one that feels victimizing um, or somehow sort of offends us to our core, it's the powerlessness that we're struggling with, the, the inability to change it, 
uh, to change the hearts and minds of others who are the offenders, if you want to use that term. Um, and, and we tend to then relive the story over and over again as a way of trying to, to claim a certain power over it. And I think that your meditation, Abba, please, is a first step in letting go of the need to be powerful or even to uh, have power over this dynamic and rather to let go and in a sense to relinquish that altogether. Um, and in that, I would say my, my encouragement to you is to continue along that prayer, aware of the, the dynamic or the role of power and the way it's playing and the way it feels oppressive to you now, um, because there's now three times in, in, in recent uh, weeks or months that, that the same uh, hornet's nest keeps getting stepped on or stirred up. And to <clears throat> start with the realization that you don't have power over it and allow that, especially during Lent, it's a beautiful image of the powerlessness of the cross, uh, allow the sort of the way you need to die to that energy to be the place in which God can then, uh, in a sense, uh, resurrect something new or life-giving in you. And, and not knowing the details of the, uh, of the situation, um, I'm hoping that that resonates with you in some way as a way forward. It, it does. That's Father Keating's programs for happiness, power and control. And, and yeah, that's the powerlessness. But I guess actually the question is, am I hitting the right understanding between the idea of a thesis and self-help? Am, um, am I beginning to understand that differentiation? Um, uh, to be honest, Ruth, I'm not sure uh, if I understood how you're differentiating the two in this case. I, the way I was differentiating is, is that often the prayer would have been, really the prayer in my heart would have been that Abba makes this better. Make, tell me what to do. Tell me how to be in better control. I'm sorry, he's deaf and so I can't tell him to stop. Okay. So how, to be in, how to be in better control as you pegged it so that I can make the situation better, so that I can feel better, versus where I found this myself this morning, which was simply help me to open to you better and to consent more to your action in my heart, so that out of my woundedness, I don't turn around and wound them instead. What they did was unintentional. Mm -hmm. They they there was no intent for harm. So, so then I would, with that distinction in mind, I would say, yes, that is exactly the distinction that you're arriving at. That is precisely where I would, I would see the two both diverging, but also ultimately coming together. It's a matter of the process of how you get to that place. But, but I would say, yes, good work in that. Okay, that, that's what I was looking for was that understanding because yep. that differentiation is really hard to grasp. So thank you. It is. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Um, I see we have three more hands and we're a bit after eight. So let's, uh, let's conclude with Steve. We'll start with Paula, then Sue and Steve, and then we'll move to practice this morning, uh, both introducing the next one and, um, and seeing if people have discussion around the former. Um, so with that in mind, uh, Paula, go right ahead. Yes, I just wanted to share um, one scripture <coughs> passage that was became very, very important to me a number of years ago, um, relating to much of what was said today. And it was the scripture passage, very simply, where um, I believe it was Peter's mother-in-law was sick, and they brought Jesus to Peter's mother-in-law. He, <laughs> he healed her. And she immediately got up and started being life-giving and serving. Um, and that really spoke to me years ago um, because all the modalities of healing that come to me, it was like, I was going, oh yeah. So the purpose is it, not just to feel good and enjoy my wellness. It is so I have life within me 
that I can be life-giving for others. So simply said that that's, you know, that's just simply saying, I believe what, um, what is being shared with these other, with all these other words um, that for my, for my healing, there's a reason Jesus comes to heal me through all these different modalities. And it's so I can then pour out in, and it can be in very simple things like making a, a, a dinner for my family, or it can be things where it's in a community working together, um, just serving Jesus or being life-giving. I love that, those words even more. But I really, I think, Ruth, thank you for the barking dog. Um, I'm sorry, she said, the dog is barking, he's deaf, and so he can't hear me to say stop barking. And I'm going, oh my gosh, did that speak to me? So <laughs> I've got this deaf barking dog in me. And it's only through this meditation yeah, that all of a sudden off. I can hear the barking dog. Oh, okay. And I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, that really served as a, a what, what do you call it? A metaphor mm. of something that goes on within me as I, I gain insight to something that I'm deaf to within myself. And right. because of that, then I can be more life-giving. So um, I thank this beautiful dog of Ruth's for giving me that meditation. Thank you, Paula. Well said. And, you know, the, to come back to Peter's mother-in-law, that dynamic of she immediately got up and began to serve. We see that play out in the citation of the text I even read today. And we see it elsewhere as well, that when someone is, if you compare the state of the demoniac uh, that Jesus first encounters, who is chained up around the tombs, which is to say surrounded by death, isolated from the community because of this obsession with the, or possession, if you will, of these demons, the legion, <clears throat> and so forth and so on. It, as we move through the, the very graphic story of his exorcism, it concludes with him going back to the Decapolis, which is a, a region of 10 cities, as it were, is what the term means around the Levant. Uh, and he goes back to the 10 cities and essentially um, begins preaching the gospel. So we see that once freed or liberated from these death-dealing uh, relationships with our demons, uh, chained amidst tombs, we are free to do what his mother and Peter's mother-in-law did, to go and serve, to go and preach, to go and be that light now for others. So there's always a sense that our own healing, our own well-being, our own forgiveness, our own exorcism of demons is not merely for ourselves. And this comes back to maybe my opening point. It's not merely about a kind of, well, well, good for me, I'm all aligned and perfect in my spiritual life, but it's always meant for the community. How now do I become the Christ light, uh, life-giving for others in the community? That, that, is, that we see consistently throughout, throughout the gospels. Right. Thanks, Paula, for that. Yeah, beautiful. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Sue, please. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, this feels a bit edgy to say, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I'm sort of an edgy person. But um, as I was listening to you, Father <laughs> Vincent, speaking earlier, I thought, why is he wasting all his energy getting so uptight about what other people are doing or not doing? And then I just brought it straight back to myself, because I know what it feels like when I'm doing that. Mm. And it's like, um, I picked up this yesterday, something that I drew um, some weeks ago and I put it on my front door so that it would be um, a reminder every time I go out <laughs> where I have to encounter people. And um, it says, be vigilant only for God and his kingdom. But what I really like on the back is um, what it refers to, and it is from A Course in Miracles, but it says, the alertness of the ego to the errors of other egos is not the kind of vigilance the Holy Spirit would have you maintain. And, I'm, you know, I've so been so good at pointing out errors and getting uptight about things and... And all I do is I just feel stressed and I separate myself from other people. And, um, and I want to trust. I love, I love it when it says the Holy Spirit can use everything that we have made. And I ultimately, I, just, I do have to watch my mind and then ask the Holy Spirit to guide me to any action from there. 
And when I'm too busy pointing the finger at others, um, someone says, you know, you've got four fingers pointing back at yourself <laughs> when you're mm -hmm. pointing. So I don't know really why I thought, okay, why am I having this today? Why am I bringing this into the room as I'm joining on this in this session with you all? So it's, I'm really saying it to myself, but I loved it when it was mentioned that um, there's no gain in blaming or shaming. And I'm not suggesting that you're doing that, but I know that when I've, I've when I, I just lost, when I get lost, I just get lost. And where am I putting my energy? And I do think, you know, in, in mindfulness or yoga or whatever it might be, I, I just have to trust that I might think, oh, well, they're just, what are they doing? They, they haven't, they're not really on the right track. But I just want to trust that the Holy Spirit can be in charge when someone just gives their little willingness and everything can be used. And um, so, yeah, I just felt to say that. And really, I'm just saying it to myself, just as my reminder when I go out the door today, <laughs> Um, I, I love it when it says it's not the kind of vigilance the Holy Spirit would have you maintain. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate your comments today. Thank you. Uh, Steve, please. Thank you, Sue. I, I really appreciate that, too. <clears throat> well, the comment I'm going to make next has just been, we're sitting here in our living room, and I've got, this might be kind of squirrely, and I literally have a little squirrel looking in our picture window at us today. So anyway, Cory Booker, uh, Senator Cory Booker, uh, you know, I uh, had the capacity to listen to a lot of the uh, senatorial confirmation hearings. And of course, oh, we have a lot of things we could say about this or experience this. But um, <clears throat> I, I just wanted to say that um, I needed some of the words. I know politicians are very... Uh, crafty with their words, et cetera, et cetera. But I found myself resonating into my bones uh, when he was um, trying to give aid and comfort to um, uh, 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 Judge Jackson. And I don't know where he fits on the Asasis scale, but um, I appreciated uh I, I needed that kind of relief, I guess. And today I'm going to join the we have a march in Des Moines for the, uh, supporting Ukrainians, and part of it is because I want to be—I want to try to find energy that puts me in with people that I po probably disagree with on some things. But um, I want, maybe it's selfishly, I want the experience of being together with other Americans. I, I get—I'm so tired of the all the polarization. So those are some comments that may re relate to. Um, what we're talking about this morning, but I wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Steve. I, I wish you well in the um, demonstration later today. Uh, hopefully that's a meaningful experience. I, I do think, you know, just a, a very brief response is that um, we do find that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and just mute there for the feedback, uh, that we do find that uh, when we, when we even are attempting to do the inner engagement or the inner work of looking at ourselves, um, how that really just shapes the way we we engage the world, the way we receive the world. And many of the comments I heard this morning are directly related to that very dynamic um, and yours included. So um, just a, you know, a continual encouragement as we move forward in this chapter, I'm really going to wrap it up with precisely this kind of question. What does all of this mean? in our engagement in the world? What, what does it actually look like? And many of the comments I heard today are already pointing us in that direction in various ways. So we'll have a chance to look at that together. Um, but thank you for that. Let me just take a moment then to um, call up our meditation uh, challenge, if you want to say, or practice for the week, and then discuss what was uh, asked of you for this current week for those who would like to stay back for that. So I'm, I'm just asking you to reflect on this question. <clears throat> what is the intersection between your spiritual practice and transforming action in the world? Let me do that down here easier for you. Um, <clears throat> and how does one flow into the other, inform one another, and sustain one another?
So just to take a look at that. So uh, I'll be sending this to Joanne later this morning, so she'll have it out to all of you. But what is the intersection between your spiritual practice and transforming action in the world? And this comes, I think, to you know Steve's precise point and um, Sue right before that. Uh, and how does one flow into the other, informing the other, sustain one another? Just to give some thought to that. Um, as for last week, which is what I've asked you to discuss potentially for this week, if any of you would like to, <clears throat> is to name a demon that you're already familiar with, not some new one you're searching out or trying to discover. Um, we all know that they're legion. Um, but ask not how it impacts you interiorly, but how it impacts your community life and those around you. So how do the demons we, we grapple with interiorly impact um, those around us, our community, uh, whether that be a town or a neighborhood or faith community or workplace, et cetera. Um, and just wonder if there's any, um, any shares today, today around that, if anybody gave some time to that. Meantime, I'll just be catching up a little bit on the chat. So this is Pam's and I, I have a um, thought on that. I, sure, Pam, sure. Um, I thought to different things I, that I experienced as I looked at what my demons were, um, were pretty self-contained, but thank you for this because they certainly were not. I, I learned that it robbed others of talents and love and energy. And I mean, I know that sounds really simple, but, um, I, I realized the depth of how much it robbed others and um it's really great motivation to uh <laughs> work on all of that mm -hmm. yeah thank you Tams. That, that's precisely what i was hoping to raise some awareness around and i have to say that nothing in my life prepared me for the last five years of ministry where i really learned that my position made me or my community quite vulnerable to my own demons and how much i need to keep that in check um, and, and that, I think, is the basis for authentic uh, community of any kind, but certainly in my case of spiritual community. If we're going to have intimate spiritual community, we cannot leave everything on a sort of social surface nicety that when toes get stepped on, when egos get bruised, when, um, you know, people get hurt inadvertently or vertently. Um, that this the, the 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 reality then is to move into it, not to shy away from it, to mask it, to cover it, all for the sake of social niceties or politeness, or to maintain the peace, but to really find safe ways for people to engage in understanding. Oh, these were sort of clashes of ego, or clashes where our demons or rough edges are kind of meeting one another. And the beauty has been. And the hard work has been facilitating many of those conversations and, if, and, uh, and out of that, arriving at deeper growth, self-understanding, understanding of another human being, how people need to be loved in different contexts and how valuable that is for really shaping an intimate spiritual community and how, how little I see of that happening in so many churches, which I think why they fail in often to be uh, to lack in their capacity to transform because they remain sort of social clubs or places where there's sort of public niceties, but not really the hard work of continually uh, expanding, reconciling, and moving into these places where we can find that healing. So uh, I appreciate your saying that. I, I'm sure if we all look, uh, as I have particularly over the last five years, at, at our own demons and their impact, there's a lot of fertile work to be done that could be very fruitful. So thank you for that. Uh, let's see, Steve. Okay, well, um, I had to miss last week, but um, it did come to me that one of the traps <clears throat> of being a trustee in a church and also being male, I think, is the desire to have certain outcomes, whether it's in the building or whether it's in the people, um, in the community itself. Uh, when we, when I, I found myself thinking about how my desire for things to come out a certain way was affecting my capacity to be present to what was happening right now, and uh, the uh, kind of uh, uh, co consumption of energy around the task 
of making things come out a certain way. And so I'm kind of working on that. And um, uh, that's a little kind of a, a little demon I'm <laughs> trying to deal with a little bit. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. That That's right. And, and, you know, very often in my own work, I see very, very good people whose hearts are very much in the mission and ministry, say, of this particular parish and who have goals and objectives all for the com intended for the common good. And then you realize, oh, there's all kinds of you know misunderstanding or miscommunication or clashes that happen all as we're trying to achieve this common good. And rather than just sort of let those, you know, stepped on toes or bruised egos sort of just remain how do you try to just acknowledge it and realize, hey, look, we've all got the same goal. How can we learn from this? Establish, for example, better forms of communication or self-understanding or our dreams and vision and mission for the parish, and then to move forward collectively. It's not always easy, but it does pay off. And, and so I appreciate your acknowledging that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, Joan, please. Hi, um, I have, uh, I'm probably not going to demonstrate it right now, but I have a, a facility with words and I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of like it that I, that I can do that. And it's, and the demon part of it is often to do with sarcasm. I'm, I'm kind of good at that. In fact, I got a plaque a friend gave me that puts me as a member of the National Sarcasm Society. And um <laughs> The thing is that what it can do easily is um, alienate people, uh, hurt people, uh, and actually move them away from a possible good point that I might otherwise get across, but I'm so busy trying to say it in a clever way. So um, that is something that I... Uh, I, I, I kind of, str I struggle with, but I, I laughing because I don't really struggle with it most of the time hard enough. Uh, so what I, my point is that when you're good at something, that is probably the worst temptation. That, that is the thing that, that, that makes you want, want to do it. And, um, and really, well, it makes you good at it. So, um, that's what you have to get. If you're uncomfortable doing something and it doesn't feel quite right, that's probably maybe a better thing for you to do than the thing that you're really good at because you do it for the wrong reason and it doesn't have such a good effect. Thanks. Yeah, Joan, thank you for that. I don't know if you remember Saturday Night Live years ago, Jane Curtin. Uh, she was hysterical uh, and she had a series that she repeatedly called Hey Sarcasm. It was sort of a spoof talk show where she was just dripping with sarcasm with everything she said to her guests. And it was hysterical. Um, but yeah, so to your point, there is um, uh, the, the very thing we can be potentially good at and that we're aware that we're good at it becomes a two-edged sword. Right. And, and therein comes the capacity for pride and so forth. So all the more, how do we use the gifts of the talents that we have humbly? And this is where true humility, I think, comes into the whole spiritual picture, both in interiorly, but also especially communally. Um, how do we do, how do we embrace that with humility? Um, and uh, it's. Um, uh, you know, I'm a pretty good loader of dishwashers. I can get more in there than most people would ever believe. And I mean, it's born of a desire to save on energy and water. And so I'm pretty haughty and obnoxious with people who don't load a dishwasher well, starting with Fernando. Um, so I have to learn humility around that. Um, and uh, and so, but this is just sort of anecdotal about how we tend to, to do that. Uh, when we become good at something, we can become prideful around it. Uh, and that actually has the reverse effect of what that gift is intended for. So thank you for your honest admission. The first step is naming the demon, uh, uh, Joan. So you did a good job there. <laughs> All right, uh, Sue, we'll, we'll wrap up with you this morning. Go right ahead. It might be a little bit of a repeat, but um, yeah, I'm really good at being sarcastic. But someone, um, someone said to me, you've got a really good mind. And it was like, oh, and then she said, you need to give it to the Holy Spirit for its purpose. And I think the humility is for me to have willingness 
I think there's also false humility. I think it's okay to own the gift of a good mind that's given by God. And mm -hmm. then I then it's my choice. Okay, God, help me. I have some willingness here. Help me to repurpose that. I love the word repurposing. I can give everything over to the Holy Spirit for repurposing if I'm willing to get to let go of my purpose for it. And I think almost celebrate the gifts that we have. So I would almost encourage, I think it was Joan, to, to like allow the gift to be used for the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Don't try and bury it in a grave or something and say it's bad. Um, so I just felt to, to share that. That's what I've been encouraged to do in the past. But it's a daily practice and I have to keep remembering and not, and not dance with guilt. That's another big demon that I've had, dancing with guilt. Mm -hmm. And every moment I can see, oh, you know, just the tiniest thing of the day. And I think, oh, I'm using that again to make myself feel guilty. And that separates me from God's love. Right. Yeah. Th that. First of all, yes. Thank you for that last comment. And um, I think that's probably something many of us, unfortunately, either through osmosis or some form of... <clears throat> Uh, education, conscious or otherwise, learn that dance, um, which is something I think we we wrestle with. Uh, as for the sharp mind, I, long before COVID, when I would have contemplative workshops here at St. Columbus, one of the uh, attendees, she said to me um, that someone once said to her, um, you, you have a sharp mind, but you have to get out of it. You need to go and get into your heart. And her response to me, which was reiterating what she had told them, was, but I like my mind. It's it's a fun place to be. And, and I enjoy the thoughts and, and I enjoy exploring intellectual concepts. And I, I was really able to relate to that because um, I, I, of course, like that, too. I mean, sometimes I find thoughts or concepts or theological ideas so beautiful that they I, I describe it as overflowing into my heart. It goes from this intellectual to a more affective joy. And if I didn't give attention to the nuances of a, of a theological sort of concept, I would be missing all that heart joy that goes with it. So um, I just say that to affirm uh, your own response, you know, that, yeah, appreciate a, a sharp mind and, and, and yes, give it over and repurpose it. Um, but not not with guilt, but with real joy for what for the gift you've been given. It's a beautiful thing. Um, okay, uh, final comment then, Carol. I just saw your hand fly up. Okay, there, right? uh, mine's <laughs> a question. I have such a hard time with the heart head thing because because of the science background. I mean, the heart <laughs> right. is just a muscle. <laughs> so, I mean, what, so what I, you I, I, the heart head. Oh no. So so I have a hard time understanding. You know, and and. Oh, what's his name? Bob Mischke from Thomas Keating. When, and he's a surgeon. And I said that to him and he, he, he rebounded back to me that know about the chakras and all this kind of stuff. So help me understand, because I'm a mind person too, obviously, and um, analytical and all that kind of stuff. But how do we, so what, what do you mean by that? I mean, I know everybody else in this group understands, but me, but I, I have a hard time when so, could people say that to me too, that the biggest trip you'll ever make is from your head to your heart. So how do we, so what does that mean to, to, to get into your heart and to, you know, is it, you know, is it feelings? Is it, you know, recognize, is it when I recognize that the Holy Spirit is, is trying to change me and I succumb to it? Is that my heart? I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, um, and it's my evangelical background that also puts me off because so many people there were so engaged in emotion. Everything was emotion, you know, right. and, and, there's so, no and I think that's very life. dangerous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, it could be. Yeah. So so let me say that, first of all, I, and I'm, I think I think I was detecting sarcasm, but just to be sure. The heart is not when, when we speak spiritually or biblically about the heart, we're not talking about the physical muscle. We're talking about the core and center of our being, which implies a kind of way of knowing or intuiting divine presence or action or whatever within the within oneself that is not necessarily subject to a rational argument or proof or intellectual making sense of and allows it to kind of just 
be. I, it's kind I'll, of your instinct because I wasn't being sarcastic, Father. I really wasn't. <laughs> no, okay, no, yeah, no. So then, let me. So all the better. We clarify. So by heart, from a spiritual point of view, we're not talking about the physical heart. Um, although one could say, I guess that's a piece of it, given that we're, uh, it's an extension of the inner reality or core where we most fundamentally uh, encounter the divine, your conscience experiences, intuitive um, experiences, real or meta rational, not necessarily irrational. Um, <clears throat> all of which of these are, by the way, are intellectual terms, but oh well. So, so let me try to respond to it, not with an intellectual sort of argument, but with a story that I was told once by a young man when I was at uh, St. Um, oh gosh, I guess it was St. Paul's in Madison, Wisconsin. I was, I was a lay person working uh, in campus ministry for students, undergraduates and graduate students at the time. And this was a young man who was struggling with, with being gay. And he just didn't know as a Catholic if this was something he could rightly or ethically pursue or if this was something that was really contrary to who he was as a Christian. He really, really grappled with this. And he was attending a church in which um, they started a devotion where around the clock, 24-7, <clears throat> they would do a, uh, what do you call it, um, like exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. And every hour of the day, around the clock, someone would be sitting in this side chapel uh, to, to be. And he had chosen Thursday nights from 11 till midnight. He was a graduate student, was always up late anyway, and he, it was very quiet and he enjoyed that quiet. So in the midst of him doing this for multiple months, he he was so fraught with, he was so distraught over this, this question that was gnawing at him and how to live his life that he, um, he, he started a novena that he had found in a little pamphlet in this chapel. And it was a novena to Teresa of the Little Flower. And for those of you who don't know, the way the novena is supposed to work is at the end of the nine days of your prayer, you set out an intention, you offer prayers nine days. And at the end, you're supposed to get your answer in the form of a rose of some kind. This is, this is sort of the way this goes. So um, he, he, um, he basically set it up this way. If it's okay for me to pursue a relationship, let it be a red rose. And if it's not, let it be a white rose. And he began his novena in earnest. Now by, by chance, and I don't think he planned it this way, the, the last day of his novena fell on a Thursday and he had no sign of, of any kind of response until he gets to the 11 o'clock PM moment when he needs to do his work of sitting with the Blessed Sacrament. And he told me this really tearfully that what had happened was he walked into this chapel and for the first time in all the months he had been doing this sit, there was a bouquet of roses over the altar where the sacrament was. And I said to him, Steve, what color were the roses? And he says, they were freaking yellow roses, Vincent. <laughs> <clears throat> and he looked at me to say, what am I, what do I make of this? <clears throat> and I said, sense of humor. <laughs> I told him, I said, how did you feel the moment you saw them? And he said, I felt loved. And I said, that's your answer. You see, that is, that is a response of the heart. That is not one in which you could think rationally through. It was, what did you feel in the moment you saw a bouquet of yellow roses? <clears throat> oh, you felt love. You need to listen to that, right? So it, it, yes, a sense of humor and yes, a sense of the answer. The way through your question is not to think through logically, is this right or wrong? But what does it mean for me to be loving? How is it that I'm loved in the world and how can I be loving and then you have to decide what that means for you, in this case, as a gay man who's Catholic. What does that look like? And that's, that, I think, is a better way to talk about what I mean by the heart um, than, than, than to try to give you a theology around it. That's, that's that intuition. And we need to attend to that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That really helps yeah. a lot. Yeah, it was you a know, lovely story. I mean, it was a very tearful but a funny moment uh, when he shared that with me. Well, yeah. and I was always afraid of my grandmother dying and um, me losing my faith. And when she died, my faith just expounded that day. Mm. And it wasn't me and it wasn't here. It was my heart was exploding. And it was like God telling me, you know, 
were true. You know, I mean, you know what I mean? I, that's one of those experiences that I had where it was like, no, this is, um, you know, real or whatever, you know, I mean, I, and it was where my intellectual mind was trying to talk me out of it. You know, of <laughs> my heart was telling right. me something else. Dwight has, that, he wanted, so but go on. And that is precisely what I'm suggesting is, is it. Right. I, and, you know, so we could explore. Did you say there was another hand? Yeah, Dwight. And also just, you know, being oh. Catholic, too. I had heard that whole time and be, then being around the evangelicals that were anti-gay. I had gay friends in high school and I just wasn't my instinct was saying they're wrong. No matter how many verses they threw at me or or, you know, I was like my instinct said, no, not buying it. <laughs> Yeah, and that's where we, yeah, there's a lot of struggle, struggle around this. For where, sure. where, you know, where you sit there and you go, I don't, I don't know how it meets, but I just am not buying what I'm being sold here. So, it's, but anyway, Dwight, you had your hand up. No, I wasn't. I was just uh, uh, saying like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, thanks. Dwight. Yeah. Okay. That I saw, Dwight. I saw your little uh, response there. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so that brings us uh, close to the hour. So um, I, I just want to thank you all for uh, for hanging in there. Um, the faithful remnant, as I know, is always there by the end of our two hours or near near to it. Um, and uh, thank you for all your your insights and your your comments and your sharing. All very beautiful and authentic, and I'm I'm deeply appreciative. It makes me just uh, love this part of my week to be with you all. So <clears throat> as you go forth into the week, um, look deeply at your own heart. And look, look there with that mirror um, and know that you do so uh, before God who is loving and compassionate and leads us always uh, into that great silence of the flesh where we become that light for all others whom we encounter. So go in peace and go in safety and go in love and go with my blessing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And I look forward to seeing you all um, next uh, Saturday. Have a good one. Bye-bye.